During Advent, I am preaching on the incarnation as the greatest wonder of all because it is. Wonder is the cure for the jaded cynicism and and soul-crushing boredom that is so present in our disenchanted technological age. So we need this wonder. In fact, my prayer for you during Advent and Christmas is that this wonder will come upon you. Maybe this wonder will sneak up on you. You'll find yourself just woo, slipping away into wonder. When you see a, a nativity scene, which of course you will, when you see a nativity scene, just, just pause, just pause. And look at that babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and say to yourself, this is God. This is how God came to us. This is God among us. And just let the wonder begin to wash over you. Now, before we explain the theological implications of the word made flesh, we should first of all bow in wonder and worship at this holy mystery. The mystery that God in Christ joined us as fully human that he might redeem, recover, heal, save all that it means to be human. And with that in mind today, I want to preach on the greatest wonder of all as the new humanity. Now, when I think about Advent, one of the first things I think about is the Hebrew prophets. These prophets were poets of profound imagination whose poems shaped the contours of Messianic expectation, by which I'm saying they gave us the Christmas card language. (laughs) Our Christmas cards come from these Hebrew poet prophets who anticipated the coming of Christ. It's their poems that hint at a virgin that will conceive and a star arising in Jacob and a ruler born in Bethlehem and a child called Emmanuel. We get that from the Hebrew prophets. The poetic is related to the prophetic in a way that prose cannot. You know, prose, that's just, you know, that's, that's email language, just prose, just Prose is is technical. It's good for detail. Poetry is less technical, but also less limited. Poetry opens up the potential for a lot of interpretation. Poetry, when it's really poetry, stays stays open-ended. It doesn't close down. It stays open-ended and waits for the fulfillment, the interpretation. I'm quite sure that these poet prophets said more than even they understood. I mean, when Isaiah speaks of a child being born that will be called Emmanuel, God with us, I suppose he had something in mind, but what it really turns out to be, I don't think he had in mind. That's that's the nature of real poetry, real songwriting, is that you say more than you even know. Um, this is the nature with all the, the greatest poems and songs. They just, you'll, you'll hear, hear the great poets, the great songwriters. They'll talk about it. I, I've heard Bob Dylan say, especially of his early songs, he says, I don't know how I got to write those songs. I don't know how I got to write them. They just came to me. And that's the way it is. We might ask the uh, poet songwriter, what, what does this line mean? And they might very well, in honesty, say, I don't know. You tell me. It came to me. I wrote it. I sing it. I'm not sure what it means. And the greatest Messianic poems, written centuries before Christ, can only be fully understood in retrospect. You couldn't, you couldn't 
understand it when it was written. You get some ideas, but it's only in retrospect of Christ that we look back and go, oh, that's what that meant. And of all of the Hebrew prophet poets, the greatest was Isaiah. So I want to go to Isaiah chapter 9. This is one of Isaiah's greatest poems. Starts off with a little prose. I don't know. It's setting the context. It's, it, and then it breaks into poetry. Here, here's the prose part. This is, this is written around, this is written circa 700 B.C. I mean, you know, just, just rewind the clock 700 years for us. I mean, what was, how different were things in 1323 than now? I mean, how far away does that feel? Okay, that's the distance between Isaiah and Jesus is that, is that it's 700 years. And he said in the context, he says, but there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. All right, so the setting is a particular place. The land of Zebulon and Naphtali. These are, these are two tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are given a certain inheritance in the promised land. The land of Zebulon and Naphtali. They include towns like, oh, let's see, Nazareth, Cana, Capernaum. Ah, indeed, this is the land of Galilee. Now, Galilee is the Via Maris, the way of the sea, it says here. What that means, the way by the sea, rather, the way by the sea, is that Galilee is part of this land bridge that connects this land corridor, this, this corridor. Desert on the right as you're moving north, sea on the left. It's this corridor that connects the great empires of the north, Assyria and Babylon, with the great empire of the south, Egypt. As such, it unfortunately was a place of frequent battles. It was a land of anguish and gloom. There were regular wars and battles in this place. It was fertile, it was beautiful, but it was subject to a lot of anguish and gloom because of the constant warring going on there. That's the setting. And now the poetry breaks out. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. So the poet says, look, Galilee, I know, I know it's been a land of anguish and gloom. He, he writes it like in the past or present tense, but he's actually, it's, it's, he's looking forward. He doesn't know how long, but he's looking forward to a day in which Galilee, having been a land of dark, darkness, anguish and gloom, that suddenly something's going to happen there. Something's going to happen in, in Galilee, the land of Nazareth and Cana and Capernaum. Something's going to happen there. There's going to be a great light that's going to begin to shine from that place. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who lived in the land of darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. The people exult when dividing plunder. In other words... Anguish and gloom are going to give way to joy, rejoicing, exultation. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. So, so some kind of bondage and slavery, oppression is going to be broken from something that happens in Galilee. It'll, it'll be a miraculous victory like as in the day of Midian. This is a reference to Gideon's miraculous triumph over the Midianites. For all the boots of the tramping warriors. Remember, this is this land corridor where these armies are always marching to and fro and then fighting battles right there. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. 
This is an echo of an earlier poem by Isaiah when he says, they'll turn their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Four. Now, now he, gives us, he gives us the reason why this is going to happen, why joy is going to break out, why light is going to shine. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, a child, a child is born, a, a truly human being, a fully human, a child is born, a son is given to us. Well, I don't want to spoil it, but. This is the son of God. This is the one, a child born to us, fully human, a son given to us, fully God. Authority rests upon his shoulders. I, I like the more, the more famous translation. The government rests upon his shoulders and he is named and he's given four laudatory titles. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. 700 years B.C. But here we are 2,000 years after. 2,000 years into the year of our Lord. So I want to look at this. I mean, this right here, this you know, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is, this is pure Christmas card material right here. A child shall be born unto us. A son shall be given unto us. That's on your Christmas cards. Wonderful counselor. Yes, Jesus is the wisdom of God. Say amen. amen. Mighty God. Yes, Jesus is true God from true God. Prince of peace. Yes, Jesus is the one who commands peace to the nations. But what about this title? Everlasting Father. How, how is Jesus... The everlasting father. We're, re we're used to referring to the first person in the Trinity as the father. Father, son, and Holy Spirit. But here the son, this child born unto us, the son given unto us, that clearly we identify now as Jesus. How is this son given the title everlasting father? What does this mean? Well, it means that Jesus Christ is the everlasting progenitor of the born again. It means that in Jesus Christ, fallen humanity finds recapitulation. It means that Jesus Christ is the ground of being for a new humanity. All right, that's all just a bunch of lofty theological language. So let's, let's see if we can simplify that and see what's going on here. In one of his more theological letters, the epistle to the Ephesians, the apostle Paul says that in Christ, God has created one new humanity. One new humanity. In several of his letters... Paul, who is our greatest theologian, Paul contrasts Adam with Christ. Adam with Christ. Adam or Adam. The, the name actually just means man or mankind or humankind. Adam, Adam, humankind, refers to the origin of the human race. And in its origin, humankind, we discover, is subject to sin and death. This should come as no surprise to you. This is your experience. That the human experience is we are subject to sin and death. This is, this is what's referred to typically, at least in Western theology, as original sin. It should not be understood as original guilt. We're not born guilty. We're not guilty. We don't carry the blame of the original sin of Adam, Adam, humankind, but we are born into a condition of being enslaved by sin and subject to death. Evidenced by the fact everybody's a sinner and everybody dies. So that's, that's obvious. That's the situation. That's the predicament. 
in the origin of humankind, Adam, bondage to sin and mortality are passed on. They're inherited. You don't, you don't have to teach your kids how to sin. They have, they've inherited that from you. And they'll pick it up. They'll get pretty good at it. And we all are subject to death. This is the problem of the human condition. We're slaves of sin. You know, you're, not, you're not going to overcome sin by just sheer willpower. We're enslaved by it. We're slaves of sin and we're subject to death. You're not going to will yourself to live forever, forever either. You may try, but you know, death's undefeated. So this is our human condition. This is our problem. This is our predicament. Well, the good news is that Jesus Christ has become the everlasting Father. Oh, okay, now we're back to, now we're back to Isaiah 9 6. Jesus has become our new, let me say it that way, our new everlasting Father. Jesus is our new origin, our new Adam, our new ancestor, our new progenitor. You can use all these words. This is what is in theology called recapitulation. That's what this is called. It's called recapitulation, which means to rehead or to sum up. Let me recap. It means to sum up in a new way. So in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says that God has a plan to sum up. Sometimes it's, that's translated recapitulate. A plan to sum up all things in Christ. So in Christ, the human race is recapitulated or recapped or reheaded or reconfigured. Or this may help you rebooted. I mean, when it's really messed up, what do you got to do with the thing? Reboot it. In Jesus Christ, humanity gets a reboot. A start over. A recap, a recapitulation. A reconfiguration. The incarnation gives humankind a new ground of being. Adam, not Christ. Or you can say it this way. The incarnation gives Gives humanity a new everlasting father, a new ancient ancestor, not Adam, but Christ. Now, in his book, it's one of the most important theological books ever written, written around the year yeah, 350, something like that, maybe a little later. St. Athanasius, in his book On the Incarnation, he says this, and I just love, I love this, this is good. One of the greatest early theologians of the church says this. You know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes obliterated through external stains. The artist does not throw away the panel, but the subject of the portrait has to come and sit for it again, and then the likeness is redrawn on the same material. Even so was it with the all-holy Son of God. All right, so, so what Athanasius, belonging still to the ancient world, what he's talking about is the paterfamilias. This is, you know, this is the Roman world. The paterfamilias, the, the head of the family. And in well-to-do, wealthy families, in the Roman world, you would have painted on a panel somewhere in the house a portrait of the paterfamilias, the head of the family. Athanasius says, now, if this, if something should happen and this portrait of the paterfamilias should become stained, marred, obscured, damaged in some way. Oh, no, no. You don't throw away the panel. No, no. What you do is the subject must come again. This is Advent, folks. The subject must come. The subject must come again and sit for a redrawing so that you can recover the image of the everlasting father. The pater familius. Come on now. Do you see where we're going with this? That we had a pater familius who passed on to us. We have, a, we have a human origin that passed on bondage to sin and death. And so it's stained and it's marred. And we're not fully bearing the image of God. So 
The subject comes in the form of the logos. The word of God comes to this panel, comes to human flesh. The word, the logos became human flesh entered into human flesh that the image of God might be restored in humanity. The portrait of what it means to be human is repainted in the flesh of Jesus Christ so that Jesus Christ is the new progenitor, the true ancestor, the Paterfamilius, the everlasting father of a new humanity. And when we look at Jesus Christ, when we look at Jesus Christ, we see two things simultaneously. On the one hand, we see what God is like. This is, I've, this is what I've stressed for the last, I don't know, 10 years, maybe more, 12 years. My recurring theme has been, if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. Jesus doesn't change God because God doesn't change. Jesus reveals God because we didn't understand what God was really like. So I say it. You know how I say it. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time God wasn't like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. So when we look at Jesus, we see, first of all, we see what God is really like. This, this is the son that is given to us who is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. We, we know what God is like. But when we look at Jesus, we also see what humanity is called to be. Another great theologian of the early church, Maximus the Confessor, he said it this way, Christ has given us an entirely new way of being human. We inherited a way of being human from our human origin, from Adam, humankind, Adam. But now there is a new Adam, a new paterfamilias, a new everlasting father, a new ancestor, a new origin, who is Jesus Christ, giving us an entirely new way of being human. Now, in the creed, we confess that Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is, this is another Advent theme because Advent looks back to the coming of Christ, the Logos made flesh and dwelling among us, but it also looks forward to the perusing, to the appearing again, to the summing up of all things in Christ. It looks forward. And he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. Christ has come. Christ, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Christ shall come again to judge the living and the dead. But Christ is already judging us because we already all know that Jesus is the standard. I submit to you, everybody knows that. Not just believers. Everybody somewhere deep down who knows anything about Jesus knows that Jesus is the standard of a life well lived. So that a life well lived is ultimately determined by how much does it look like Jesus. He is already the judge. So it's not a biblical worldview that is the standard. It's a Christ-like life. Thus, the question isn't, can we find it in the Bible? Because you can find all kinds of stuff in the Bible. Tell me what you can't find there if you go looking for something to justify yourself. It's not, can we find it in the Bible? It's, can we find it in Jesus? Because he's the paterfamilias. He's the one that we are called to become like. Now, the hope of apocatastasis, universal restoration, the restoration of all things, is found in our recapitulation, our re-summing up in Christ. The Apostle Paul said it like this, For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be given life. Why, why do we die? Why are we mortal? Because we come from the origin. We come from a humanity. 
subject to sin and death, and we all die. But in Christ, what's the apostle say? So also in Christ, the new everlasting father, the one who reboots humanity, so also in Christ all will be given life. Adam, as human origin, is the origin story of how we came to be. You can study this. This is called anthropology. I find it fascinating. You can study anthropology and find out Adam, the human story, the origin story of all of us. Adam is the origin story of our human condition. And we all have ultimately the same origin story. We're all fleshly and mortal, carnal and mortal. But Christ is the source of our salvation, our rescue, our redemption. He's the source of immortality. The Apostle Paul says it like this. The first man, Adam, became a living being. Which, by the way, he's quoting Genesis 2-7. He's quoting Genesis 2-7. The first man, Adam, became a living being. And the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So... The Adam origin, the Adam origin, the humankind origin of humanity gives you your biological life. It's generation, 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 DNA, 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 DNA. We now have the technology. You can study it. You can do the, you know, the Ancestry.com, 23andMe. Find out, you know, where you came from. Turns out it's what I already knew. <laughs> um, Swiss, German, and English. That's my anthropological DNA genetic history. But this biological life, no matter where you came from, is bound to sin and subject to death. Christ, as the last Adam, is not merely a living being. So, so you, have, you have the human origin story, Adam, and genetics and all that are passed on. And you come to be somewhere down the line. You came to be. And you can kind of trace it back a ways. You can do these tests and find out, you know, about your chromosomes and where you came from and all that sort of stuff. Adam was a living being that passes this on. But Christ, as the last Adam, is not just a living being. He's a life-giving spirit. Christ is not just a living being passing on DNA. Christ is a living spirit. One of the things I'm going to work with you on this coming year is to renew your mind that spirit is, is ephemeral and slight and wispy and weak while matter is... No, it's the other way around. Matter is what passes away. Matter is what decays. Matter is what gives up the ghost. Spirit is what is eternal. God is spirit. And it's lasting and it's eternal. And the first Adam, yeah, he's a living being. The second Adam, the last Adam, is a life-giving spirit. Who's he giving life to? Hello, family. Our new paterfamilias, our everlasting father, Jesus Christ, is giving us the spirit of life. The biological life given to you by Adam and then mom and dad is subject to death and decay. You know this. But the spiritual life given to you by Christ is not subject to death or decay. We are destined for a spiritual body in the age to come in resurrection. A spiritual body. Again, don't think, okay, well, you know, I've got, I've got a real body and then I'll have like a spirit body. And I'll be a ghost. No. It's a more, it's an imperishable, imperishable body. It's a body. It's a body. I mean, you see Christ in resurrection. He has a body. It has different properties than ours. Don't really understand it all. But, but you know, you can touch him. He can partake of food. We're destined for a spiritual body, which is a more real body, an imperishable body given to us in resurrection. And you say, what will that be like? And I say, oh, 
Another opportunity for more wonder during Advent. You can just sit around and go, I wonder what that'll be like. Amen and amen. Stand up with me. Oh, this is good news today. This is good news. Jesus, everlasting father of a new humanity. And now we come to the table to participate in the life-giving flesh and blood of our paterfamilias, our everlasting father, the last Adam who is Jesus Christ. Let's prepare ourselves now by first confessing our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now join with me in confessing our sins and receiving the forgiveness of the Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Amen.